are these people? All right. I guess they they had a, they found a mistake. We missed something in the Twitter files. In July of 2020, 130 major accounts were hacked at Twitter, including ones belonging to Barack Obama, Joe Biden, and Elon Musk. To fix the problem, Twitter hired a famed ex-hacker turned cybersecurity expert named Peter Mudge Zatko, who in 1998 was part of a group that famously told the Senate that the internet could be conquered by hackers in 30 minutes. Zatko quickly hired a firm called Aletheia to do sweeping audits. The contract for one included the name of singing censor Nina Jankowitz. The documents contained alarming proposals for new content suppression schemes. This week I'll be working with Michael Schellenberger and Alexander Gutentag at Public to publish new Twitter files reports, including never released correspondence suggesting Zatko was fired for agreeing to quote, provide information on Twitter to intelligence agencies. This is a deep rabbit hole with implications for the coming election. More on public and racket. But his question is, is, was Twitter set up by the intelligence agencies? A handful of documents cast the conquest of private platforms by security f- officials in a new light. Not only that, but the other question that we, that we are going to ask about, through all this is, were the other social media companies similarly, did they have similar people sent into their organization to then hand over their private data to this Aletheia company. So he says, from the first Twitter files reports, I worried about that the sheer quantity of material would cause us to miss something significant. We did. Racket Today is is again teaming with Michael Schellenberger and Alexandra Guttentag at Public, this time on new Twitter files reports. On Public Now, a feature called Twitter Files CIA has just gone live. Now, I am not a paid subscriber to Public. I am not a fan of Michael Schellenberger personally, though he's done some good work. And I don't want to support his outlet. I think that he also is perfectly fine with some type of corporate funding as long as it doesn't demand that he censor. And I'm not fine with that. On Public Now, a feature called Twitter File CIA has just gone live. It is long, comprehensive, and full of explosive details missed during the initial Twitter Files reporting. Michael and Alex did yeoman's work and were kind enough to let me contribute, but they found this mess in documents we had all along, but whose significance was realized only recently. Juicy. The broad story concerns efforts by intelligence agencies to infiltrate Twitter and other platforms. Other documents are relevant to efforts to deploy disturbing new con- new offensive content manipulation schemes. Nina Jankowitz makes a cameo. While the first main feature is on public, Racket will be cranking out shorter reports beginning today with each around an image or a handful of images capturing one angle of the story. And that's what this is. When Michael and I arrived at Twitter in late 2022... We remember we actually covered from the first Twitter files when Matt explains that he that he was flown to Twitter's offices and sat in that office and they laid out the conditions of what would happen with Michael, Barry Weiss, and and Matt and and how that would all go down, how they would be able to get the information and how it would be published and everything else that it had to be put out on Twitter first. He said, some of the first documents we involved, we saw involved a story already known to the public regarding the hiring of cybersecurity expert Peter Mudge Satko, which we just saw in the video. As he says, after an ub- ugly public security breach in which hackers compromised the accounts of Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Elon Musk, and other celebrities, then CEO Jack Dorsey brought in Satko, a veteran of Google, Stripe, and the Pentagon agency DARPA. What? Zatko was a former right. member of a hacker collected called L0 PHT or LOFT that in 1998 told senators that hackers could take down the internet in 30 minutes, an episode enshrined in pop culture history via a trivial pursuit question. I don't know why he found it relevant that I have to say that, but it's only because his name is interesting to say, and most people won't know that off the top of their heads. It's got to be in the genus edition, by the yeah. way. So here, where, where's this picture? It's it's funny, you know. This looks like the the scientist Brent Spiner's uh, character in Independence Day. 
with the long scraggly hair, right? Mm -hmm. Soon after arriving at Twitter, Zatko obtained this guy, this guy, this guy definitely, definitely has rolled for initiative multiple times. Definitely. Right? Right? He definitely has done that. You don't think that they've had him crunching numbers for the NSA or the CIA for 30 years <laughs> somewhere in some closet somewhere? Soon after sure. arriving at Twitter, Zatko obtained seemingly unrestricted access to Twitter's internal documentation as well as extensive information about the firm's procedures. Conspicuously, this included arrangements with federal enforcement agencies, which were strained at the time. Unbeknownst to outsiders, Twitter at the time had shut its doors, at least somewhat, to the intelligence community. At the tail end of 2019, Elvis Chan, who we, a Twitter Files all-star, who became the chief FBI conduit to the firm, and emailed the Twitter executive saying, quote, my colleagues at the fort had a query for you. The email referred to Fort Meade, which is the home of the NSA, and read, quote, a few years ago, Twitter said they would no longer provide their data feed to members of the IC. My colleagues wanted to know if that policy had changed or you would be willing to change it. So wait a minute. In 2019, Twitter had turned off the, a the, the API to all the intelligence agencies. Somehow it okay. got turned back on, right? Oh, of course. So what he says here is that the commercial, now? the commercial version of the tool included the Twitter data feed. However, the feed was disabled because the vendor said they didn't want to violate their terms in, uh, of service with Twitter. They basically say a government contractor that also has a commercial division is not doing business with Twitter's API because they don't want to violate their government contract. My colleagues are wondering if Twitter would be yeah. open to revising its terms of service to allow this vendor to continue having access to the Twitter feed. Revise your TOS for mm, one funny. vendor. My colleagues are happy to meet in person to discuss yeah, this but, issue with you if you'd like. But it's in the vague of business. It's like, hey, you're missing out on profit. Mm -hmm. Like, That's what they do. You know, we have this vendor who would work with you, but they've also get some government funding. We know that that's an issue. You could, you know. Yep. So <clears throat> Twitter senior executives. Up for us. Yep. Twitter senior executives who'd, who'd had repeated strained communications with the Senate Intelligence Committee, the State Department, the FBI, and other agencies weren't sure if they wanted to expand information sharing agreements with the fort. Trust and Safety Chief Yoel Roth, we know who he is very well. He's still in hiding, I believe, was reluctant. My sense is that a call directly with the IC on this isn't a great idea. Yeah, I think so, because trust yep. and safety chief should certainly be looking out for the data that the intel community is trying to penetrate. Director of Policy and future <laughs> DOT undersecretary under Pete Buttigieg, Carlos Manji, was concerned, however. Quote, We've seen a sustained, if uncoordinated, effort by the IC to push us to share more information and change our API policies, he said, back a few days uh, on January 2nd, 2020. So that's a year before January 6th. The hack took place six months later on July 15th, 2020. As one former Justice Department official told me, quote, I doubt they'd send someone high profile in as a mole, but when Obama's account gets hacked, the government's at least going to have someone drive by the building. Zatko reportedly started work on November 19th, 2020. That's five months after the Twitter hack, where Obama's account was compromised. A month later, on December 29th, 2020, Yoel Roth explains to Zatko that for the last two years, we've also had a regular cadence of meetings with the FBI and Foreign Interference Task Force, that's the FITF, and fed FBI complaints to the firm's JIRA ticket system directly. There was no mention of either of either the My Friends at the Fort episode or the separate teleporter channel that Twitter opened with the FBI before the November election, although Roth did say that he hadn't made a comprehensive list of all of the inbound from the Bureau. Because there were so many different communications happening across so many different people, they couldn't even keep track of it all. 
This was in response to a letter from Zatko identifying Roth, former FBI general counsel and Twitter deputy GC Jim Baker, you remember him, associate GC for global policy Stasia Cardiel, and associate GC for global law enforcement Angelo Scherer as Twitter's points of contact for government information sharing. All of these people had former government clearance, and I believe they all used to work for the FBI. But ba Baker yep. definitely did. In the letter, Zatko asked if there were there was any Google Drive folder, some emails, TLP style or whatever, or accounts to please provide me with access where appropriate where I can review. The new arrival wanted examples of what Twitter's communications with agencies like the FBI looked like. <laughs> Unreal. Shown this email. One former military intelligence laughed and said that bringing in anyone with a hacking background and immediately giving him a global pass key showed the incompetence and lack of sophistication of Twitter. Yoel Roth got yeah. clowned. I said at one point, you know, I said I almost felt bad for him because there was nothing he could do and he was way overmanned, overmatched, and they were going to take him down no matter what. But he was really bad for the job, too. DARPA is able to compartmentalize these guys. That's why these programs all have compartmentalization, the analyst said. They put them in a dark room with a fucking candle and a pad and a fucking pencil and say, fucking fix it. What they don't do is give them access to everything else. What did they think was going to happen? What did happen? Zatko quickly commissioned a series of audits by an outside firm called Aletheia, with extensive political and intelligence connections, its initial capital investment included $10 million led by Ted Schlein, who's a board member of the CIA's venture, venture capital arm in QTEL. Aletheia ended up doing two rounds of audits. The first was a review of Twitter's cybersecurity profile. The second was a more retrospective analysis of failures leading to January 6th featuring Singing Censor and former Disinformation Governance Board head Nita Jankowitz. Now, that's interesting also because January 6th hadn't even happened when the hack had happened. When Mudge Zatko got there, J6 didn't happen until 2021. So they decided to include that too now? Jesus. There's the Aletheia logo. When Twitter failed to adopt all of Aletheia's recommendations, the situation became contentious very quickly. Do what we say or else. Zatko was terminated, ready for this, leading to settlement discussions in which his opening demand was $60 million. Jesus according, Christ. according to one Twitter attorney in the files, they eventually brokered a $7 million agreement that allowed Zatko to continue communicating with government investigators. He had then turned whistleblower, and amid great fanfare testifying to the Senate that Twitter's cybersecurity failures would cause real harm to real people. And he got paid $7 million by Twitter to do it. <laughs> this was in September 2022, wow. Months before Elon Musk took over and began releasing internal company correspondence. Some of the reporters brought in to do these releases were concerned about Zatko's claims about the, the sizable percentage of bots or monetizable daily active users. Again, look at what they in sock fucking language. MDAU <laughs> on the platform. Musk by then had brought a complaint against Twitter for misrepresenting the percentage of bots as less than 5% of accounts. Musk believe it was perhaps 10 times that number. Pundits worried Zatko's complaint would help Musk's legal case, and there were documents even in early Twitter files showing some pre-Musk executives suspected ties between the two. One Twitter attorney even announced in an email We'll be exploring the links in coordination between Musk and Zatko. Look, they're all connected to the intelligence community, so it wouldn't terribly surprise me. But why Jack would hire somebody 
who was secretly a mole working for Elon Musk, who was about to buy the company and then whistleblow on it, doesn't really make much sense to me, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Concerned about any story that could be construed as favoring Elon, I was reluctant to spend any time on Zatko-related correspondence. This was a big mistake. Twitter, it seems, never found a link between Zatko and Musk. However, Schellenberger and Public found an internal chat involving a Twitter attorney making a more explosive claim, quote, without the knowledge or support or ma of management or the board, Twitter learned that Zatko had engaged with members of the U.S. intelligence agencies and sought to enter a formal agreement that would allow him to work with them and provide information to them. He was going to be a corporate spy or a, a government spy inside a corporation. Yeah. In another document, corporate Twitter... Spy. Right. In another document, Twitter attorneys prepared talking points to present to the Department of Justice about Satco, cataloging alleged performance issues he'd had. The document describes how Zatko became aware of a possible security issue with a Twitter employee's ties to China. Quote, Zatko was aware of the issue, having learned about it separately through a contact at CIA. How, how, how could he do that if, if he's an independent Twitter employee? How does he have contacts at CIA and be talking about this shit? Uh-huh. These two pieces of information look explosive on paper, but a larger story emerges in conjunction with the Aletheia audits. These reports were written up by multiple publications, but never fully released. They imply that Twitter couldn't handle security responsibilities and needed to build a broad knowledge management system based on partnerships with outside sources capable of providing threat intelligence feeds like Hamilton 68 or like Aletheia. Recommendations are made about draconian approaches to removing purveyors of disinformation about COVID-19 misinformation, safe and effective, QAnon, violent hate groups, and foreign government-operated IO. Uh-huh. That, by the way, what they're talking about there, foreign government-operated IO, hey, they're talking about Russia, China, and their intelligence operations and agencies, but they're also talking about um, WikiLeaks and the Gray Zone, who they are now starting to classify yep. as non-hostiles or, or as hostile non-state actors. Yep. There's no way to read these reports except as a forceful suggestion that Twitter expand the scope of its cooperation with federal enforcement agencies and with other platforms. An internal battle by Twitter lawyers to retain control via the attorney-client privilege of the Aletheia documents showed they were concerned that the entire episode would be used to add pressure to the push described by Manji to share information with the IC. The back and forth of that entire battle is recounted in the public story, but I'll also drill down in the coming days. And I think we have another piece on that next. The emails dug up for this tale are in themselves not conclusive proof of anything, but show how deeply felt within Twitter was the pressure to expand sharing agreements with not just the FBI, but agencies like NSA. The strength of the report put together on public, and which I'll be recounting according to theme on Racket, is that many of the principals commented, in some cases at length, not just about the Zatko episode, but the larger issue of defense and intelligence agencies and contractors with ties to these bodies, pressuring platforms like Twitter to open their doors. Nina Jankowicz, with whom we had a spirited back and forth, Aletheia CEO Lisa Kaplan, who I believe is one of the girl bosses that um, Ian had found, and InQtel board member and Aletheia investor Ted Schlein, all gave fascinating answers to questions about this episode. While Michael and Alexandra fleshed out how this whistleblower episode was used to further enmesh Twitter with intelligence, intelligence agencies, I went back through the documents and attachments and cataloged the more bizarre material. Some of the Aletheia audits piggy piggyback on themes from the CTIL file story we did with public last year, 
which we also covered here on How Do We Miss That? Describing a volunteer censorship group promoting offensive tactics like creating sock puppet accounts and infiltrating private Facebook groups and Twitter DM threads. Topics you will read about. A detailed proposal in Alethea's audits for pre-platforming or a, a form of digital pre-crime in which disfavored users would be cast into artificial environments or voids where online experiences would be synthesized. Real posts might be replaced by fake content like dog pictures, quinoa recipes, or sports scores. That's the article we're going to talk about. There's also a scope of work arrangement delineating eyebrow-raising pay arrangements for Nina Jankowitz and other characters. What a surprise that they all paid themselves out. The in-depth audit of Twitter's potential relationship to J6 undertaken by Jankowitz and other which contradicts nearly every analyst, what nearly every analyst has said about that issue publicly, and evidence that other platforms already submitted to the Aletheia style recommendations that Twitter ultimately rejected. Meta definitely went along with it. They definitely bent over. <laughs> yep. There's a lot more in there, including, of all things, an exchange showing both Glenn Greenwald and myself were being monitored by an information security contractor. And evidence terms like hashtag drain the swamp were monitored as disinformation. All of this has to be understood as background to an already brewing fight over who will get to play internet gatekeeper in this election cycle and using what tools. It was public scoop and I was fortunate enough to be asked to help out. So I recommend hopping over there to, the, to read the major feature but you have to pay to do that. Racket will tackle the nooks and crannies beginning in the next hour. Up next, information voids. And I don't believe that that's the one that we're going to cover. We're going to talk about, oh, that might be information voids. That's the one where they replace your, your timeline with posts unbeknownst to you when other people go to search your timeline. You see your posts. They do not. Oh, speaking of suppression and censorship, INN is heavily suppressed, as Reef loves to say on Friday night or on Wednesday night on INN News. Check out Reef and Colin on INN News Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, by the way. Yeah. In order to support independent media, you can donate to INN. There's that little QR code down in the bottom left corner right now that's showing to go to the Jesse Jet Computer Fund. That is currently sitting at about a thousand dollars. We're trying to re to, to raise it up to two thousand. We just reached a thousand last night. Thank you so much to everybody who donated. If you can't donate, please like, share, sit back, enjoy the content, share it with everybody you know, and especially people that it would make mad. So I've got one right uh, again. Substack, Rumble, Cash App. You see all the other links and other ways to donate and support us. Also, sharing our YouTube videos. Watching multiple YouTube videos will put more of them into your algorithm and you'll see our content more and more. And of course, subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications if you can.